Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in tonight. On behalf of Mitchell Kaplan, the Coral Gables Chamber of Commerce, and all of us at Books and Books, I welcome you to a virtual evening with Lori Rudiman to discuss her new book, Betting on You, How to Put Yourself First and Finally Take Control of Your Career, published by our friends at Henry Holt. Millions of us worldwide are overworked exhausted and trying our hardest, yet not getting the recognition we deserve. It's time for a fix, and Lori Rudiman knows how to do it. Lori is a former human resources leader turned writer, entrepreneur, and speaker. CNN recognized her as one of the top five career advisors in the U.S., and her work has been featured on NPR and in the New Yorker USA Today, The Wall Street Journal, and Vox. She frequently delivers keynote speeches at business and management events around the world and hosts the popular podcast, Punk Rock HR. To moderate this evening's conversation, we're joined by Lulu Garcia Navarro, the host of Weekend Edition Sunday and one of the hosts of NPR's morning news podcast, Up First. We're very fortunate to have them both with us tonight. Throughout this evening's broadcast, you're invited to ask questions by clicking the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen, and you can order a copy of Betting on You for purchase at Books and Books below by pressing the green button. We appreciate each and every order and your donations from viewers everywhere. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guest to the virtual stage. Hi, Lori. Hi, Lulu. Welcome. It is my absolute pleasure um, to have Lori here this evening and welcome to everyone here. Um, this is a great book. It is a book that is timely. It is a book that um, I read avidly because we find ourselves at a crossroads right now, right? In terms of work, in terms of the way that we're living. I mean, these are difficult times um, and a lot is going on. I wanna start by asking you to tell the story uh, about how you started thinking about this topic and how you came to your excellent advice. You hated your job. Yeah, Lulu, and thanks again for being here tonight. We are at a moment that is super interesting in our society, and you are bearing witness to it in DC yourself. So I would love to get to that at some point in our conversation tonight. A little too close for comfort, but yes. <laughs> yes, you, you've got the job of the century, ladies. So we all want to hear about that as well. But I um, had a job that was not as exciting as yours, not as interesting. I worked in human resources doing what I thought would be interesting people related work, but I was actually just firing people. And there's no shame in that. I mean, that's a job that people do and it paid really well. And as my family reminded me, wow, you've come a long way from where we're from. We are a working class family from the Northwest side of Chicago. My mom had a GED. My dad graduated from high school, but had a job he hated at the phone company for 28 years. And I really felt like having gone to university, taking on all this student debt, I had to pay it back. And the way that I paid it back was taking my liberal arts degree and going into HR. Ah, that That's sounds it. like a natural fit. Yeah. I, you know, I mean, I like stories and I liked reading and I got to read resumes. That's about as close as it got. But, you know, the more I worked with people, the more I got to see stories and narratives come to life before my eyes. And every day was like an excursion into deviant human behavior, either at the corporate level or at the employee level. So it was just a fun, interesting, crazy experience. If I were an anthropologist, it might have been a better fit. That's for sure. I, I mean, what is so interesting about um, HR, which you really bring to light here, is that you do know all the kind of stuff that's going on underneath that is normally hidden by sort of closed doors and private conversations. Um, HR knows it all. We do. And, you know, we're really bad at keeping secrets. So I don't know why people tell us anything, but I would hear rumors and innuendo from one person and then another person would come in my office and confirm the behavior. I mean, it was just an insane experience to have for over a decade. And, you know, if you like drama and I kind of liked drama, you know, it was 
interesting, but it really started to wear on me because the more I tried to fix things, which is what I thought HR should do, the more I realized HR doesn't fix anything. We fix what's broken in our lives. And HR is just there to, I don't know, make sure the company doesn't get sued. That's about it. So anyway, in this book, you say that the modern workplace is not sort of designed in the favor of workers. It's not a place that really actually acts in our benefit. Can you explain why that is? Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, work is made to enable and empower and enrich an elite few. And we've gotten really good at lying to workers about the purpose of work. But when you're there, you are hired to solve a problem. And it's not a problem that necessarily benefits a lot of people. It benefits the people at the top of the food chain. So we've gotten really good at lying to workers. And we wonder why they come to work and they lack purpose. They lack meaning. They lack direction. Instead of having a more honest conversation about you're here to do a task, you may or may not enjoy it. If you find purpose, great. If you don't, Let's have that conversation. We talk about company culture and employee engagement. And we used to put in ping pong tables and foosball tables when that was a thing and give them beer. But what people really want is equal pay for equal work, good wages, and an opportunity to have relationships, whether that's at home or at work. But I don't know, we've muddled it up, we've overcomplicated it, and we've not been honest. And so we find ourselves, um, many of us, in this situation where we feel unfulfilled at work, where we're going to a place that we may enjoy what we're doing, we may not, but but there's often shortcomings. Mm -hmm. There's often things that make us feel that we're not being as productive as we could be, that we're not um, mm -hmm. a part of something that we might uh, want to feel that we're contributing to. Mm -hmm. So I'm. So your advice is basically to basically forget about work. And you say, before you can fix what is wrong with your career, you have to fix yourself. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Like when you're looking for a first step and you're saying like, I need a change or I wanna understand what else might be out there. Mm. Well, you know, I read about- Speaking 30, for a friend, just yes. that. I read about 30 self-help books before I wrote this. And what I found is that there were all of these self-help platitudes that sounded great and sound like but we're not actionable. And then I thought back to all of the people who come to me and complain about work. And what they're complaining about is being exhausted, not being able to set boundaries, not being able to manage their time, their families, the obligations of work. And these are not problems that are existential. These are not problems that are systemic. These are time management problems. These are problems around boundaries. And so the book really focuses on how you can invest in yourself and live a life with some value, with integrity, say yes, say no, understand why you're doing these things, and then see work from that perspective instead of waiting for work to solve all your problems. You know, so many individuals in my life think they're going to get that next job and it's going to be great and it's going to make them feel good. And then they get there and they're like, is that all there is? And it's like, yeah, dude, that is all there is. If you are only who you are, and you're not happy. So if you're not happy looking in the mirror, you're not going to be happy looking on a Zoom meeting with your new colleagues. You know, in this book, you you give a lot of examples. There's a lot of anecdotes, yeah. which I really love. Um, there's just like a lot of stuff from your own life and the people that you've interacted with. And it really made me think about sort of how much time we put into our jobs. Yeah. Um, I am one of the people that you describe in the book where it's like all about my work, you know, everything centers around that. It's all consuming, it's yeah. exhausting. And you, again, counterintuitively say, become a slacker. I do. And yeah, and I, I had some trouble with that. I mean, it, it, t tell me about your road to slackerdom. Yeah. Well, Lulu, I'm really grateful for you and everybody else who's a domain expert. They know what they're doing and they're really invested in their work. You know, I have animals. I love a vet who is obsessed with my animals. Like, that's really great. But I don't want a one dimensional vet. I don't want a one dimensional doctor. I don't want someone who's only doing that because that means they become myopic and they have blind spots and they miss what's going on in the greater world. And I saw this through my work at a global drug company where I worked at a company called Pfizer. Some of the best performers. We all know that name now. Yeah, they do. Yeah, <laughs> it's a small company, not maybe. It's a small company. It might be saving humanity right now. Totally. But anyway. And 
<laughs> you know what, Pfizer, they know how to do one thing and that's definitely work. So I'm, I'm all in with that. But I saw that some of the best performers there, the people that I admired the most, worked a limited schedule. You know, they put in good work and they worked their eight hours, their 10 hours, but they had these rich, robust lives beyond work. They weren't the kind of people that you would go out with after work and all they would talk about is office gossip. They mm -hmm. were going to the movies. They were going to the opera. They were on vacation. They talked about their children, extracurricular activities. And so I kind of tagged along and followed this one guy who seemed to be living this amazing life. And he said, it's complicated. I have to make choices. They're not always perfect. I get irritated, but you know what I am? I'm a slacker. I do the job, I try to do it right first time, and then I move on to something else. And I thought, God, this guy is on to something. And throughout my entire career now, coaching and advising and consulting, the highest performers are people who don't necessarily have balance or have it all, but they have other dimensions to their lives. They've invested in their underdeveloped personal lives and they take all of that good stuff and then bring it to work. It's really beautiful. It's like an inside out job. So how do you get there? Well, it's baby steps, isn't it? And a lot of trial and a lot of error and a lot of failure. I talk in this book about all the mistakes that I've made trying to secure this life with a little bit of balance. And, you know, I picked up a few hacks and tricks along the way, although I hate those words because they're so cheesy and hokey. But I surround myself with people whom I admire and whose lives that I want. And if I can't connect with them, you know, there are superstars and celebrities out there who I think they're actually doing something with integrity. I just mimic the good stuff. I was about I to say, I can't be friends with Chrissy Teigen. So, I mean, <laughs> it'd be nice, but, you know. Right, right, right. I mean, she's one. But look at the way that she just is confident in her own skin. She's authentic. You don't have to be Chrissy Teigen to be inspired by what she's doing. There are mentors that you can reach out to in other industries, but I think the most important thing I've ever done in my life is pick up this little trick called the pre-mortem, mm. where before I take a big risk, like, you know, I go into a meeting to pitch myself before I pitch myself for this book, I took a minute and I wrote down all the ways that I would fail. Like I confronted that imposter syndrome just for a minute. I gave myself a container and I thought, well, I'm going to babble. I'm going to say the wrong thing. I'm going to write the wrong thing. And after a minute, when the timer went up, I looked at that list and I fixed it before I submitted my book proposal. And that's a cognitive exercise that's actually been proven by science and research that I write about in my book, this idea of the pre-mortem. If you try to fix what's broken before you do something, you improve your chance of success by 30%. Oh, I mean, I mean that that. I mean, that's amazing, right? That's a competitive advantage for a job interview. How are you going to do a job interview? And it's the opposite of what we're often told, which is sort of like the power of positive thinking that in fact, you just have to sort of embrace the, the, the possibilities and it's all going to turn out great. And you say actually the opposite, imagine the worst and then yeah. try and see what you do about it. That's right. But give yourself a container. You don't want to spiral. I think oftentimes we go through something, we fail, and then we look back and then we just have anxiety because we can't do anything about it. But if you preemptively flash forward and try to figure out how you're going to blow it and fix it before you blow it, you give yourself an advantage that I think Lulu Chrissy Teigen would actually kind of like. <laughs> Let me ask you this. I mean, one of the things that um, is particularly useful is how you describe um, sort of work relationships and how you find people in your life that can guide you and help you. Um, on the one hand, you're talking about people that you admire and you surround yourself with, you surround yourself with them um, in a sort of personal environment, but how do you find those people professionally? How do you sort of connect with people who um, can help you professionally, but also you know give you that value, give you that meaning? Well, in this book, I talk about how you should make friends with HR. And I don't say that. Wait like a second. You just said HR, you know. Well, I know. You can't keep a secret. You make friends with them because you want to ask them, who can you hook me up with? Who do you know that can be helpful? Because I tell a story in the book about a young woman named Bella who's having a career crisis and actually said something really terrible about her boss and it got out. And everybody wanted to fire her. But I swooped in and I was able to have a conversation with Bella and try to find a mentor for her, someone who had been in her shoes, a young and upcoming leader who just didn't have anybody to look to and ask advice to. So I paired Bella with a mentor 
And not only did they like hit it off, they had a great relationship. Bella got promoted. She didn't get fired. So I feel like there are all these people around us that we could connect with, whether it's going to HR, whether it's going to a friend, whether it's going out on LinkedIn and saying, I'm having this problem, I just need some help. We live in a global community of humans who make mistakes all the time and are generally empathetic, but nobody can help you unless you ask. And you don't wanna wait till you're almost fired like poor Bella. You wanna do this a little bit more proactively. So I have recently been asked um, for some help by a young woman. Mm -hmm. um, I was connected um, professionally and they have discovered that they are underpaid and they want to ask for more money. And I was wondering what, how you thought that should play out, because I actually find that this is one of the most persistent and yet mm -hmm. difficult things to confront. Um, you know, we are in a world where women are paid less, women of color in particular. Um, and, uh, but there is a movement to be more transparent about salaries and certainly about advocating for yourself. So how do you do that in a way that is professional and gets you what you want? Yeah. Because I'm going to use this. <laughs> I love it. I think that's great. First of all, there is one person on the planet who is an expert in salary negotiations, specifically for women and women of color. And she's mentioned in the book, her name is Ching, C-H-I-N-G, Valdezco, V-A-L-D-E-Z-C-O. And Ching Valdezco has had a profound impact on my career because she, yes, she really understands how to negotiate. And she absolutely believes women are not taught to negotiate. We're, you know, we're, the bias is against us. Even when we try, we're seen as aggressive or we may be seen as just, you know, uninformed or naive. And so she really is an expert in helping women navigate through this. So I don't want to pretend to be Ching, but I'll tell you what I know. The best thing you can do if you really have concerns is to go test the waters in the marketplace and go look for work elsewhere. And this is what Ching advises. You know, your company would fire you in a heartbeat if they could replace you with a robot. They would. So you are under no obligation to stay there. And looking is just looking. So go out into the marketplace, see if you can get another offer, see what kind of competitive information you have from that experience. And then in a very organized, methodical way, you're going to want to go talk to either your supervisor or human resources. But you don't wanna just throw up a lot of PowerPoints at somebody, you wanna tell a story. This is who I am, this is why I love the organization, this is what it means to me, these are my contributions, and yes, I have data over here, but I'd like to have a conversation about where I sit relative to my male peers. So it's all about building to that story. I mean, Lulu, you are a master storyteller. You understand how this is done. If you just come in like so many women have done in my life with a PowerPoint presentation, it's DOA. Mm. Um, I mean, I, I think part of the problem is that the way that we're paid really hits us, you know, um, in the heart in a way, because it, actually makes us feel that that is our value. Yeah. And so you talk about how you really have to be dispassionate, that you have to kind of separate yourself from um, the way things might make you feel and really look at it in a more cold eyed, you know, way. Well, I have two philosophies. The first is feelings are not facts. This is something that's really important for me to just know as a human being, but it was also important in human resources because I had feelings about the stories that were being told to me. And it was my job to get like a good investigator to the facts of the case, right? So mm. feelings are not facts. So knowing how you feel today, how you feel about your job may mean that you feel that way and that's valid, but you may feel differently tomorrow. So that's important. The second philosophy I have that's important for this is that your work is not your worth. So whatever you do for a living, that is not your worth. You are a valued human being because you were born. If you never go into the office, if you never work another day in your life, you deserve the opportunity to move, to eat good food, to have an education and to pursue your passion and to find your purpose. Unfortunately, we have a system in, of work and 
capitalism in place that are antithetical to that. But I fundamentally believe that your work is not your worth. Your worth is in relationships. Your worth is in the people that you surround yourself with, how you're of service to your community. And if you do those things and actually invest in the personal, you're going to elevate the professional. I've seen mm -hmm. it time and time again. You start and fix work through the inside out approach. That's what mm -hmm. I believe. Let's say things haven't gone well, yes. <laughs> as they sometimes don't, and um, you have fixed yourself as much as you can, and you have um, done all the things, and you have gone out there and looked for the other job, and you found something maybe. Yeah. I have found the other thing um, that has been challenging in my life is oh. leaving gracefully, um, because oftentimes, there might be some hard feelings. Sure. Um, if you're leaving, oftentimes you might feel a little upset, um, especially if there were some salary negotiations or other things. So uh -huh. yeah. um, you've got some really good tips about, about this because I also think that this is a place where people make mistakes. I mean, I've always given advice to people, like, first of all, don't leave a job unless you have a job, you know, all that kind of stuff. Right. But I will say, you know, it's the, it's the obvious stuff. Don't burn your bridges. But I think that people have trouble getting to that other side of the bridge. So let's let's talk a little bit about that. Lulu, I want to hear your stories about getting fired now. Now I'm <laughs> I might have left right before I got fired, but okay. There you go. That's the timing. Well, you know, in the book, first and foremost, I have a chapter about leaving, which could be voluntarily or involuntarily. And the advice that was given to me by a dear friend named Jennifer McClure is that everybody good gets fired once. And if mm -hmm. you think about the people who've done amazing things in this world, they have not always fit in. They've irritated a boss. They didn't get along with their colleagues. But the interesting thing is that they took that experience and they didn't just wallow in shame, or maybe they did for a limited period of time, but they learned from it. They tried to grow from it because they recognize that their work is not their worth. They have other things to contribute in the world. They're on a mission to be of service doing something great. So that's first and foremost kind of whenever someone is worried about quitting, everybody good gets fired once. So let's put that out there. But I think the second thing is you're right. There's tried and true advice around leaving and you know, don't quit a job unless you have one. But sometimes things happen. And in the book, I try to teach people how to leave like an executive. And Lulu, you know how the big wigs do it? They get a severance every single time. Mm. All executives leave with money in their pocket. How? So <laughs> because they negotiated up front. Whether they leave because they've quit or they leave because they're terminated, they leave with money in their pocket. And it's not impossible for you to do the same thing. And so in the book, I try to, at a very basic level, teach the methodology. It's something I've been teaching for over a decade and it works. But you have to be brave, you have to be bold, and you have to be willing to be fired. But if you're leaving anyway, it's worth asking because that little bit of money could be the difference between you feeling good in that next role. Maybe it's money for your retirement, or maybe it's the thing that's going to launch your side hustle into a future business. So if you don't ask, they're not going to give it to you. And it's my mission to really democratize some of the shenanigans that happen at work. And that's what I try to do in that chapter. You know, you in particular um, have been brave. I mean, you talk about your own journey, leaving yeah. what it was a very lucrative job at a very prestigious company um, to, you know, launch, you know, what became your side hustle to your full hustle and and you got your Whatever whole thing going is. on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're a consultant, you've got a podcast, you've got a book. I mean, you know, yes. you do it. We we know each other because we have, I um, you know, I, we have, you've been on our air and, and, and you know, we've yes. been on panels together. Um, so I, I guess... My question is, though, in the book, you actually give advice to someone um, about maybe not leaving their job. So when do you know that it's the time to try your dream, you know, that you've always wanted to do if you want to open that bakery or, or whatever it was? Um, and when is it the time to stay? Yeah. I think that's such an individual question, but I will tell you that it's never a good idea to leave because you hate your boss and you can't take it another day. And I talk about this in the book, you know, even as a consultant, 
I have a lot of freedom. I have a lot of autonomy. I've done well financially and I never quit unless I know what's next. And I worked at a very, very lucrative job in Silicon Valley. I was consulting out there and I had a woman who hated me and was constantly shoving her shoes in my desk workspace as if it was just storage area. And I would come back from a weekend. I would fly into Silicon Valley and go in and her garbage would be under my desk, right? And I thought, I don't need this, I'm gonna quit. But even I believe you never quit a job unless you have something lined up. But it doesn't mean that you can't plan for what's next. If you're feeling that burning visceral feeling in your, you know, your chest and you've got, you just, it's just heartburn every day, you don't have to stay forever. You're not a victim, but you do have to make a plan, which means thinking about your finances, thinking about your physical and emotional well-being. Because if you take that energy and look for work, you're never going to get hired. Their recruiters know how to see through someone who is running from something else. So you've got to be really thoughtful and meticulous about the way you do your search. And if you're a slacker, to your earlier point, Lulu, and you're just doing your job and you're pulling back, you're gonna have a little extra time to do that job search and a little emotional distance. So you start to take things less personally at work. And really that's my life's work, helping people depersonalize some of the drama at work and really take that energy and focus on their personal lives and live better lives at home. Um, last question before we go, two questions, cause we've got, um, People in the audience, I know that have uh, things that they want to discuss. Um, in fact, I'm getting text messages from my sister and my uh, niece who are listening in. They get priority. Um, they get priority because yeah, I'm I'm a I'm a Miami girl, so I've got you know I got people in Miami. But um, right. but I mean, I, I guess if you are looking to get a promotion, so yeah. you want to stay at the company, um, you, you want to move up. How do you get? that going? How do you convince, I guess, maybe even yourself that you're worth going to the next level or the people who are making those decisions? How do you get what you want? Sure. I mean, it starts with you and really understanding that your life is yours and it's actually worth putting yourself out there. If you have other goals, you have other dreams and work as a mechanism to get there. If you don't believe in yourself, no one else is going to put you first. No one else is going to invest in you. And so that's a reoccurring theme with a lot of different ideas in the book. But it's really around working on that imposter syndrome, that fear, that doubt. And how do you do that? Through therapy, through an EAP, not through self-help books. Right? I mean, that's the first step, but that's not the final step. This is a journey that you have to be on in your life. And then the thing that is so unfair about work and that I speak about honestly in this book is that people are promoted and rewarded at work based on whether they're liked, known, and trusted. And that's a terrible understanding of the world of work. But if you can show up and be authentic and be yourself and do work with integrity and work on relationships where people like you, they know you have their best interest at heart and they can trust you to do what you say you're going to do, you're going to beat everybody else out for a promotion because other people are playing a game that is a fool's errand. So like, be liked, be known, be trusted. Those are three great steps to get yourself going on the right path. Uh, I do come back to, again, though, being a woman um, and sure. a woman of color, because I, you know, I, I think that at least I, my experience has been that, you know, men just walk in with a natural advantage and with a confidence that frankly, um, a lot of women uh, don't have. No, that's absolutely accurate. And, you know, there are a couple things going on that are really um, pretty good about society right now. Number one is that people talk. And this is something that Lulu, you and I have talked about, you know, before mm. there used to be just kind of a whisper campaign about a guy at work who was a jerk and you couldn't do anything about it. And now we have this amazing platform of the internet and websites like fairy God boss. And even indeed we're in, you know, glass door where people can actually go out and speak truth to power in a semi confidential way. They can go on Twitter, they can create blogs, they can create burner accounts, the word can get out and more and more companies are responding to appeals 
to be better and to do better. I also think we're at an interesting point in society right now where companies are listening a little bit differently. I don't know. I mean, we didn't solve anything with Me Too and we didn't solve anything with Love is Love and we've got a lot of systemic problems. But yet I'm a little bit optimistic that things may change after this past year and that we may make progress. So that's interesting because I remember when we first talked about Me Too way yeah. back when, this is when we first met, you weren't so optimistic about change. And and I was I was right. <laughs> you know, I I <laughs> you were right. No, that's what I'm saying. I was right. right. I was right. Yeah. It does not does not feel good. And yet, you know, we've had a new generation emerge in the past couple of years. Technology has grown a little bit easier to use and more accessible. I, I just feel as if there is a tide that's changing and there are people I'm now I'm going to sound terrible, but there are people of a new generation emerging into positions Agreed. of power. So we've got a value shift in our society right now. We just need to keep being brave and we need to keep pushing. And if you are in a job where you feel like you're not being seen or heard, I don't care what the economy is make a plan what it doesn't have to be today you don't have to quit on the spot but start planning to move on and lulu people always ask me how do i know when it's time to quit you know when it's time mm. to quit. you absolutely know in your bones when you can no longer do good work and a lot of times people know on day one so if you know on day one don't wait 30 days don't wait a year don't be like my father and wait 25 years make a plan and get out let me ask you this, because I always give this advice, but I don't know if it's true. Tell so me. I might have been giving terrible advice all these years. Ooh, I yeah. also do, I probably, but I also do say to people, look and see if you can who your boss is going to be. Because if you have a good boss, you're going to go much farther, even if the job isn't the right one on paper. Um, if you have someone who's going to empower you and, you know, and help you move on, um, that is almost a better position to be in than to be um, perhaps with a job that has a, you know, looks flashier, but, um, but the boss is awful. Um, so Ooh. I don't know if that's true. So wise, so incredibly wise. You know, we talked about relationships being the thing that matters the most in this world. And if you've got a relationship with a boss and you like that person, you know them and you trust them, that will pay dividends down the road. But job, jumping from job to job, pursuing a title, pursuing money leads you to some of the people that I write about in the book mm. who are well compensated, have a great title, even like I did, and are completely and totally miserable because they're disconnected from the people around them at work. They're disconnected from their families. And all they do is sit on the computer all day long. So yeah, I, it's about choices. It's about understanding what you value. And and Lulu, I will say this: there are going to be times when even the best job sucks. I mean, hmm. you've, got, you've got a pretty terrific job, right? It's not all I do. I love my job. And, and no. bunnies and puppies every day, right? You know. I would say there are very few unicorns and puppies. <laughs> <laughs> not enough is what we want to say about that. Not so, enough. That's right. That's right. But you still do the work because it appeals mm -hmm. to you in other ways. And there's this more mature conversation I think we need to be having around work about how it's going to suck some days, but you can do the calculus and figure out if it's going to pay off for you in emotional, physical, and spiritual ways. Okay. I am going to ask um, our dear uh, host to come in and... Yeah. Um, <laughs> and moderate. And moderate yeah. the questions because I don't... Yeah. Here I am. I okay, so let's start with... Why is depersonalizing your life away from your career important? Yes. So I believe that people should absolutely, if they can, have a job that they love and work that provides meaning and purpose, but oftentimes it's overstated and really doesn't pay off like we think it does. So my response is not necessarily to depersonalize work 100%, but instead to take some of that energy and really invest it in our own lives so that we are living good lives and whatever happens at work, which is never in our control, doesn't rock us to our core. You know, the FBI 
teaches this technique. They preach this technique for their agents. They want their agents to be excellent. They want them to be consummate professionals. And this is all kinds of complicated these days, but they also don't want them to only identify as FBI agents because it clouds their judgment. It absolutely makes them too close to their work and they don't have any distance to see other things, other patterns, yeah. other, other issues in their lives. So it's important to find other things besides work in our lives in order to actually be good at work. I don't know, Lulu, what do you think about that? I mean, yeah, I think, um, I think one of the things that um, I certainly have, have found is that um, whenever I'm feeling overwhelmed and whenever I'm feeling, um, you know, when I'm having those interpersonal conflicts, which you do, you you do, no matter how, I love my boss, I really do. Um, I do love my job and I like the people that I work with, but everyone's got bad days oh, and yeah. people irritate you and I irritate people and, you know, and it's, and and some days you have to sort of, and you, and you do have to take a step back and just be like, you know what, I'm going to step back to what is my life and, yeah. and just, and just not engage in this right now. And it does change your perspective. You know, sometimes I think people are so invested in work because they just don't have a life. And that's certainly been true during COVID, right? When the world is scary and it's a dangerous place out there, it's real easy to retreat to our phones and do that email, to do that thing, because we're not going to dinner, we're not going out anymore, we're not spending time with extended family members. So work becomes this replacement for our personal lives. And, and there's no hard. boundaries as well, no. because we're sitting here. I mean, I lock the door so my daughter doesn't come barging in. You know what I mean? It's like, I do. I do. <laughs> it's a and lot I, of togetherness. These these times are, uh, I'm, I'm going to say the word unprecedented and I'm going to hate myself for it, but these are unprecedented times. They're not going to go on forever. And eventually there's going to be no excuse for checking email on a Saturday evening if we don't have to. And we have to ask ourselves, what should I be doing with that time? What would make me happy? Those are really hard questions for some people to answer. They don't know what would make them happy. I write about my parents in this book. They didn't really know what made them happy, right? They just had a weird relationship with work all the time that was completely unhealthy. So I think in order to live a great life that you can then take to work, it's time to invest in our underdeveloped personal lives. I think the other thing that you make a really good point about um, uh, about email in particular is that um, you have to respect other people's boundaries too, right? So it's not only that asking people to respect yours, but don't also send that email at, at Saturday, you know, and if my, you don't want to get it, don't nope. send it. <laughs> my, my favorite thing is people who uh, do work on Saturday and then schedule all their emails to go out Monday morning at 7.30 or 8 a.m. And then you get like 25 email messages from them and you're like, dude, you were working all weekend. Don't lie to me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you're not being sneaky with that schedule send. We know what's up. Yeah. So what happens if you've identified with your job so much that you're afraid to take the next step? What happens is that you just asked a really great question. So you have some self-awareness. I think there are all different kinds of things you can do to discover who you are and what really might interest you in a healthy way, whether that's, I'm gonna sound like a self-help author and I don't want to, but whether that's journaling, talking to friends, talking to a therapist, if you work at a corporation, you can ask that question to an employee assistance professional and they can certainly help you. But it's really first and foremost, recognizing that work has taken up too much of your time and then getting quiet and asking what would make me happy. You know, I did this when I left and started to leave Pfizer. I'm like, what am I gonna do with my time? What do I like? And I actually took a bunch of activities, you know, a learning how to swim, going to the library, volunteering. I threw them in a hat and I picked one out and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna learn how to swim. <laughs> you know, And I took swim lessons. I mean, just random stuff on a Tuesday night to figure out, do I like swimming? Do I enjoy it? Turns out I really love to snorkel. So I got that going for me now. Does your advice apply to people of all ages? Um, what happens as you get older in life? Do you have the same choices? Does the same advice apply? That's really interesting. Lulu, what do you think about that? Well, what we do know, I mean, I'm, I'm a journalist, so I always like to acknowledge reality, um, yeah. uh, which is what we do know is that um, 
particularly women, you know, over 50, but all workers um, are impacted by um, bias, essentially, yeah. and they're viewed differently um, and they're treated differently in the workplace and specifically if you're looking for a job. So that's what I would say. You, So I would like to acknowledge the hurdles before you give the the, the answer. I don't know the answer answer to them, but I certainly do know the hurdles. That's really, and that's super interesting. And it's also interesting in the wake of all of the job losses in the month of December impact. We're women, so, all yes. of them. There so, wasn't a man among them, all women. All women, all women. In fact, there were gains among men and specifically on the coast. So it's really super frustrating. So the advice around investing in your personal life, I think is more relevant than ever before at any age because systems are failing us. Systems are failing women over 50. They're failing women, women of color in general. And you know, when they fail women, systems fail men. It's not like women just exist in a vacuum. They fail the family, they fail institutions. And so more and more, Companies are saying, you can count on us till your next paycheck. So investing in yourself, understanding who you are, what you will do, what you won't do. You know, Lulu, one of the things that I write about in the book extensively is always be learning and not just learning about the job that you're doing today, which is where most HR departments invest all the training, but really being curious. All learning is worthwhile and all learning can pay off. So really figuring out who you are, what you're all about and growing your skill sets Upskilling, reskilling, new skilling are the buzzwords these days. It's just learning. Learning is the thing that will set you apart. And that is good advice for anybody at any age. But learning what exactly? Like what should we be learning? Sure. Well, you know, it's funny because I, I'm i like a dilettante and I love art and art history. And I wander all these art museums roaming around and I learn little things here and there. And I actually interviewed for a job where some of that knowledge randomly paid off when I could make conversation with the person interviewing me and they're like, oh my God, you love this artist, I love this artist. And we just started a connection. And it's all because I had a little bit of knowledge here, a little bit of knowledge there. And if you go through life, you hear these stories of people who are passionate about science and they work in, in you know, humanities, but yet that pays off. I think all learning, if you're curious, puts you in a frame of mind where you're open, you're seeing patterns, you're willing to connect the dots, it makes you quicker, sharper, and on the ball. So all learn, and that, again, isn't just Lori Rudiman, that's Harvard Business. They've done a tremendous amount of research that demonstrates the correlation between learning, happiness, and engagement at work and beyond. Uh, so this kind of connects to another question here. So. How does this advice apply to creative careers where so much is demanded of you in order to be successful? Um, and it's and it and it just you know doesn't play by the rules. For sure. There are examples of individuals in my book who are in the creative industry. They're artists, they're writers, you know, I've obscured some of their identities. But you're right, when you're a creative professional, you're often not associated with a corporation, but yet you have to work with systems and institutions like you're a second class citizen. And that's a real esoteric conversation that a lot of work-related professionals are having around the different strata of employees these days. You have contractors, consultants, vendors, full-time employees. But if you know who you are and what you'll stand for and what you'll do for a living and for money and what you won't, you can live and create a business that works for you. There's an example in my book of a woman who is constantly being pinged for after hours emergencies. And I hear this from creative people, specifically in the world of marketing all the time. Their clients call them at 10 o'clock at night with an emergency and it could have waited, but there's no boundaries there. And so in the book, I teach people how to really create a rules of the road, a common language around boundaries, around emergencies. And what you're doing is just communicating your worth. You're saying, I'm here for you and I'm here under these circumstances, these are the parameters, but anything after hours, we need to agree upon. And I think doing some of that um, negotiating around time, around attention, is really the work of all creative professionals. And it's going to be more and more uh, prevalent for creatives going forward. More and more of us are in that economy. So it's certainly, uh, there's a lot of tension. Hmm. Does your book address the culture of small businesses? Yeah, yeah, it does. I've got a chapter in there about what it was like to launch my own small business and some of the pressures around that. And I, I 
we'll just say that every small business is automatically dysfunctional because you have a founder and an owner who wants to do everything. They're head of revenue, they're head of sales, they're the CEO. And depending on the staff size, they may be their own intern. So we talk, we, like I have mice in my pockets. I talk a lot about that in my book about what it's like to launch a small business. And having now done this for over a decade, I can say that, um, it is the challenge of my life to run a small business. And I have a lot of sympathy for people who bet it all, bet on themselves and hang a shingle and then start to hire people and create a culture. I mean, that is that is God's work. So, yeah. Can you talk about male bosses versus female bosses? I mean, yeah, sure. talk about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let me just make sweeping uh, generalizations. Yeah, I was about to say. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I love the question because I think there are sweeping generalizations and then there are oftentimes some truths behind all of this. But I think gender, you know, race, gender, these are the issues of our generation. And I will say that every time HR tries to get involved and create like a listening experience where people try to talk to one another about race or gender, I get called in because things have gone off the rails. So <laughs> these are difficult conversations. So I really don't want to make any sweeping generalizations. But if someone out there has an issue with a boss, they want to talk to me about it. I am now part of your network. Connect with me on email, LinkedIn, smoke signals, however you want to do it. And I will absolutely, just because we're connected tonight, give you my best and my most candid advice if you want it. Wow, that is so kind and oh, generous. Happy to do it. So do you feel, this is my own question, like, and I know you've touched on it a little bit already, but how has the pandemic changed the workplace? What do you think are the, the maybe the silver linings? I think. Hmm. That's a nice question. Well, Lulu, give us the reporting on what you hear about the world of work and how it's changed. I mean, as you mentioned, which world of work are we talking about? I mean, we're seeing in this economy, right? It's a it's an economy that is basically split in two. And so the people that are impacted by job losses, by sickness, are the people who uh, work in the gig economy, who are having to be frontline workers, whether that be at the supermarket delivering food um, or in any other way, you know, construction workers. And then, of course, the people who can work from home and that's about a third right of, yeah, of the economy right. um and that's why you see the stock market doing well at a time when the economy and unemployment is so high um, because you have two different economies going on and not just two many economies but at least two um so you know i think it depends who you're talking to you know and i think that people who are able to work from home I think it's going to, there's going to be a fundamental shift. Um, and I think it might be even a positive one. And I think part of that might benefit women in particular. Um, we've now seen that we can't hide our home lives, right? And bosses have become a lot more accommodating to that. I mean, if we are working from home, you are going to, you know, sometimes hear people's kids screaming. You are going to have uh, people come in. You are going to have to um, deal with people's home lives. Um, I think that remote working also will probably be something that in some form will stay. Do we need to go and be at the thing in person? Um, or can we do this in a way that uh, allows more time for other activities? And so um, I think you know, there are things like that, that, that I think will fundamentally change the way that we do business and, and interact with each other in the workplace. I, That's my opinion. I love it. I agree with you. And, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, I heard a lot of employers saying, we've discovered this new thing. It's called em empathy and compassion. And we're going to ask our workforce before every meeting, how are they doing? Oh. oh my God, you didn't do that before. You people are insane. You're insane. So in some ways I'm encouraged. I don't like to see people pat themselves on the back for treating one another with empathy and with kindness and compassion, but I'll take it. Okay. I'll take it at this point. I think you're right. I mean, there is a silver lining that we're having more human to human connections with the people we spend time with. I am a little bit worried about this creeping blur between our work life and our home life and that work for so many people never and particularly never ends. for women yeah. never yeah. ends never because ends yeah. the moment 
women get off screen when they're not on Zoom. They may you're be cooking, screen. you're helping, you know, tutoring. You're it's like this endless, you know. For sure. For sure. While some men are writing books and other things. So absolutely. So I'm a little I'm absolutely worried about this. Um, but the silver lining is that okay, we may be nicer to one another for a short period of time and you know, we're commuting less, so there are fewer cars on the tr on the road. I think that's great, but I don't know, man. We're still in it, so it's hard to figure this out. That's it is I'm hard saying. to figure it out. Um, I, I was still trying to look for something, uh, something positive in what it has become. One year in, hard. Oh gosh, <laughs> I cannot wait to see you on a panel again. That's for sure in real life. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I wish we were doing it this at Books and Books in person. Obviously, absolutely, absolutely. Although this is fantastic. I haven't seen my family in Miami, Miami for a year. It's hard. Really? Wow. Oh my gosh, they yeah. must miss you very much. So I have noticed, I have a young staff and I have noticed that millennials are a little bit smarter. I've learned a lot from them actually. And they have that, what you mentioned, which is the detachment. Yes. Uh, they are able to set boundaries in a way that I find myself learning how to do, you know, how to emulate what they do. They're just like, you know, ta 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 ta. I'm gonna take care of this, but boop, it's done. But it's uh, time for me to go now. Bye. <laughs> and well, then, are you angry about that? Or no, not at all. I find it. Um, I find it very useful. I find it strange because, <laughs> you know, I was brought up. I don't know. My, I work differently. Um, but I kind of like it and I think yeah. it's smart. And so maybe they are pointing the way to something. Maybe they see something or maybe they're just like, you know, tapping into uh, what you're talking about. Well, I love that you identified this younger crop of workers that are doing that. I think, um, so just for weird reasons, we call anybody who's young millennial and I do. I know. Isn't that a thing? It's like, I mean, millennials are like hated now because they're like, everyone's a millennial, Gen Z's a millennial. There's like other generations that aren't millennials. They, they are, they are. And actually the, the true authentic millennials, some of them have already turned 40. And these are some of the women who were raised by baby boomers and really got the message, especially the elder millennials, that they have to work all the time and their work is their worth. And that's just how they were raised in a cultural moment where work was incredibly important for their identity. But I think you're right, this new crop of whatever you want to call them, Gen Z, you know, emerging, um, the emerging workforce is setting some boundaries. And I think that's because they've learned maybe from their Gen X parents or maybe because they've just seen everybody be so miserable and they don't want to work in a broken environment that they're going to do things differently. So there's this new emerging slacker that inspires me and I'm glad it, that person inspires you too because anybody who can do their job, do it right the first time and then move on has got my attention and got my respect. I will also say that Gen X invented the slacker culture, I'll we just did. say. That's for sure, <laughs> yes. I'm just saying, gotta, gotta give us our due. That's right, that's right. I think it's all that time we had being latchkey kids. Which <laughs> exactly. That's also true in my life. So, yeah, you know. Exactly. Yes. Well, in our industry, we're seeing opportunity opening up for a lot of writers of color mm -hmm. and specifically black writers. Yes. Um, and so that is gives me a lot of hope that there's going to be a lot more diversity, opportunity. You know, in that way, our book industry has changed a lot because of the pandemic. That's so, so good that you've said that because there are some really strong um, African-American women in my community that have written some amazing career books as well. And when I was doing my research, you know, I read a lot of these old, old timey books written by, you know, the Tony Robbins of the world. And I get no hate on Tony Robbins. He's doing just fine. But those books didn't really speak to me. But it was um, authors like Minda Hartz and Kanika Tolver who really are writing. Uh, the book is The Memo and um, Career Rehab, two great books for women of color, for really anybody, for human beings who are in a moment where they're like, what do I do next? Those books really spoke to me and those women are just absolutely inspirational. So I'm glad you're seeing more opportunity emerge because isn't that how this should be? Yeah, there's a lot of reinvention too, and a lot of risk taking. 
Good. It's almost like, okay, well, I came close to death. So why in heaven's name not take a chance and not, you know, do something yeah. I've always wanted to do? I so, have, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I love that. Like, why are we surviving a pandemic only to go work in a job we hate? Like and, to, and, to, and to replicate like the same thing. It's like, you know, this is, it's a, it's a chance maybe to, to, essentialize, you know, focus on something, what's important, what's important to you, you know, and, and do I have these things right? Or is there another interpretation perhaps that I've been missing? So, you know, your book speaks to all of that. And, and, um, and I, you know, I want to thank you both for being with us tonight. Um, I think maybe if you, you know, we have a few more minutes left, if you want to wrap up and maybe just like, um, you know, tell us, like why people should order your book, I think. Um, and I want to remind everyone that you can do it by just pressing the green button at the bottom of the screen, please. And we'll get it right out to you. Love that. Um, Thank you again for the opportunity to do that. And Lulu, thanks again for, you know, coming out on a Friday night. I mean, only in COVID could we do this. Kind of <laughs> it is my pleasure. I learned a lot from reading the book, I will, I will say. And well, I have learned a lot from you over the years, so. And I have to say, thank you. I've learned a lot just, you know, being in your universe, watching, you're one of the people who inspire me. You do everything with integrity. And um, I appreciate that. And I feel that in your work. So thank you for doing that as well. Thank you. Yeah. So, so tell people why they should buy your book. Oh my God. That is like... You've been telling opposite. people for an hour. So yeah, I mean, that's it's like everything in my DNA. I mean, I brown on myself all the time, but you know, if you're stuck, if things are broken, if your life is kind of chaotic and you have 10 minutes a day to learn something new, you could do a lot worse than to spend it with betting on you. Just 10 minutes a day, pop in, pop out of the book. The book is a quick read. I wrote it pre-COVID, but edited it during COVID. And I actually wrote it so that people could re read it on a subway ride to and from work in a couple of trips because I wanted them to finish it while they were going to and from work in a fast way. There's no two by two quadrants. It's not one of those business books, no bullet points. These are stories, very human stories of people who hated work, had broken lives and recovered. So mm. I don't know if that speaks to you. I would love and welcome any opportunity for you to buy the book and especially from books and books. Yes, from books and books, my yes. hometown bookstore. There you go. Thanks again, Lulu, for such a wonderful night. I appreciate it. I've enjoyed it so much. Thank you. And thank everyone who uh, is watching. Yeah, thank you. Thank you to everyone watching. Thanks for joining us. Stay safe. And I hope we're going to see you in Miami very soon in person. <laughs> Better get yes. okay. I miss my pastelitos. My pastelitos, cafecito. Todo, todo. <laughs> you have to do glory about this. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good, Good night, night, everyone. Good night. Thank you.